Father, we just want to thank you for bringing us here today, for gathering us here, for just coming to uh, hear from you, to allow your spirit to move in and through us, to just be in a posture of receiving from you, uh, of coming to worship you, to hear from you, uh, to obey you. Lord, we just want to thank you and commit the rest of this afternoon to your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, uh, Moses was preaching on agapetos, on the identity of being the beloved, of someone who is so convinced and convicted that they are loved by God, just like how Jesus was the beloved Son of God. Uh, just like how John, he himself says that he is also the beloved. And in that posture of receiving the perfect love from him, Jesus becomes and he displays what it looks like, what it feels like, what it means to be the one who is well loved, who is dearly and deeply beloved. Right? The one who walks through his entire life, his entire ministry, all in the identity and knowing that he is loved by the perfectly loving Father. That nothing on earth, nothing that he goes through, nothing that he meets will ever shake the identity from him. Right? Through trials, tribulation, temptations, nothing will shake him from knowing he is the beloved. In 1 John, he says, uh, perfect love casts out all fear. And sometimes when we react to things in our life, things that's happening, we realize that the, 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 the actions that we do that are not godly, that are unchristlike, right? The, the snaps that we give, the impatience that we have, or the fears that we have, oftentimes comes up from a place of fear. Fear of lack, fear of punishment, fear of any sorts of things, right? Uh, and the solution to that is to be one that receives and understands and is convicted by the love of the Father. That means He's so full of love that nothing that He does is out of step. Nothing that He does is uh, a reaction to whatever is uh, attacking Him or whatever is... I'm trying to shake him, All right? So today, uh, I would love to bring us into a time to abide in his love, All right? Last week at the end, uh, I went to rewatch the the sermon, right? And throughout the whole sermon, Moses was talking about the beloved, the agape love, the agapetos, you know, being one. And, and then throughout, as he was preaching, then I was thinking, okay, so how? <laughs> how how do I receive this love? He only gave the answer at the end, <laughs> which is only the Holy Spirit can reveal this identity to us. Only the Holy Spirit living in us can reach into our spirit and give revelation from spirit to spirit of who we are. So I hope to be able to, uh, or rather that was my plan, to be able to give time for us to encounter Him, to experience Him. So the word will be a bit short, but we're going to spend time in worship later on, just to have a space, time, uh, and, well, really just space and time to encounter Him, to hear from Him, to be able to allow Him to speak to us about this identity, right? Uh, I have a few things to share first. Uh, the first thing is to expound on what agape is, right? And how agape actually um, comes into context of uh, of us, how it how it affects us. So the first verse I want to share is in John seventeen, right? John seventeen twenty four. Oh, supposed to use this. It says, oh, "Father, I desire that they." that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. In John 17, in this portion, this is Jesus, the, the ending part of 
his prayer for us. It is the Last Supper. After this, uh, he is going to be uh, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be, be betrayed. So this prayer in John 17 was him coming to the tail end of his prayer. Um, him, his last words that he's praying f- to God the Father. right? The last thing that he's praying. And he's saying this, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. The last few words of Jesus, we see as He's closing off His prayer, right? He's praying and He's expressing His desire. Father, I desire that they will be with me. Be with me. Now, we would think that this with me is in the future, right? In the future when we go up to heaven. But I would say that His desire for us to be with Him is fulfilled much earlier than when kingdom come or than when we resurrect and be with Him in heaven. His desire to be with us and for us to be with Him is so strong that the Father grants Him this desire. There's something interesting in this verse that I want to just highlight to us. Uh, that brings us into this context of this whole agape thing. In the large part of this verse, he says this, For you loved me before the foundation of the world. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. The Greek word is for you agape me, agapeo me, before the foundation of the world. Isn't this interesting that before the foundation of the world, from eternity past, Jesus is in a posture of receiving love from the Father. Before the world began, the Trinity first exists, right? And all in all past eternity, the Trinity is experiencing this agape love that they share with one another. It is a, a, a relationship where there is mutual submission, mutual honouring, mutual love, mutual giving, mutual obedience to one another. This agape love that is shared before is so strong that John describes it. Uh, John, When John chooses to describe God, he says this, God is love. It's not God displays love. It's not God uh, receives or gives love. He says the embodiment of God is love. Because love comes from Him. In the beginning, sorry, not even in the beginning, before the beginning, the Trinity experiences love. It is out from this love when, when the Trinity is uh, having and enjoying and sharing with one another, that they choose to share it with men. They choose to share it with us, right? It's interesting that um, when, hmm, when who was he? Adam was first created, right, in Genesis, the interaction of how God loves men is different from, compared to us of how man receives and how man uh, gets, how man experiences experiences love is different from how we experience it. We notice in Genesis, right, when the father was walking in the garden, he shares it with Adam. As Adam was walking with him, he shares it with Adam and Adam experiences the love of God from an external point of view. It's much like how uh, you will bring your children beside you and as you're walking through life, your children and your friends experience love from you. Right? When Jesus came on earth, something different happened. For the first time, right? For the first time, the Spirit of God lives inside and is wrapped with human flesh. Which means for the first time, the agape love that the Trinity is experiencing uh, from in the past, right? Before uh, the beginning. For the first time, that love is wrapped up in human flesh. That love is wrapped up in human flesh. Never before has that form of love, that form of agape love been expressed through this way. 
Jesus then says, He's the second Adam. He's a completely new creation. Now comes to us. When Jesus dies on the cross and He says, if you believe in Me, you can become a new creation. You are a new creation. This new creation is different from the first creation, which is Adam. And so, the agape love from the past who was never like wrapped up in human flesh before. When Jesus came, was wrapped up in human flesh. When He died and rose again and when He gave um, us the, the way into becoming a new creation, today we stand with the Holy Spirit in us, experiencing God's love through our spirit. The same spirit that existed long before, whom John says he is love, the perfect embodiment of love, was displayed through the life of Jesus. Today, Jesus says, I, I'm calling you a new creation. When we believe in Him, when we believe in Him, we, our spirit and our entire being is completely regenerated. Which means today when we look at each other as Christians, right? There is something different uh, about us compared to Adam. The difference is that the Spirit of God is living in and through us today. Now this is huge because when Jesus was on earth, He did two things. He showed what the perfectly loving Father is like. Right? He says, if you see me, you see the Father. And he also shows what it's like for one to walk in perfect relationship with the Father, experiencing His love uh, shown through us. That means Jesus, when He was here on earth, He says, if a man slaps, you turn the other cheek. If a man, uh, if a man steals uh, from you, give him everything, give him all your cloak. If a man asks you to walk one mile, walk two miles. He increases the standard of what love is. And humanly, it is impossible to reach that standard. But only by the Spirit of God who lives in us. When we are connected to what Moses says is the source, the love that existed right from the beginning, the love that is so abounding, so great, so extraordinary, so overwhelming, only when we are, only when we are connected to that love, Him, that we can then be a new creation, that we can then walk in the fullness of what He calls us to walk in, in our new identity as sons and daughters of God. When John in chapter 17 says, um, by this the world will know uh, that the Father sent me, that you love one another. Oh, at first, when I first come across this, this verse, right, it was the hype, lah, because Francis Chan preached it, lah, so everyone was like, oh, it's a community, 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 right? But, but we cannot forget the, the first point, which is when Jesus says, the love that I have, the one that... When the Father is in me and you are in me, He is giving a picture of a group of people who is experiencing the agape love that Jesus experienced with the Father. He's saying that when you show, when this group of Christians who have access to this love, agape love, right from the beginning that the Trinity shares within themselves when they experience it and when they give it away to the people around them, it is through this that the world will know He is real. That the world will know He is real. Jesus was able to love well on earth. Because, firstly, because he was well loved. Firstly, because he was well loved. How well do you think Jesus is loved by the Father? <laughs> How 
how well, when I think about how well is she loved by the father, I don't know how to process through the things that he, he goes through. There, there's an account where, uh, in the Bible where his friend, he says his dear friend Lazarus falls sick and Lazarus dies, right? And Jesus has the power to heal him immediately, right? Like the centurion who asked him, heal my servant because he is sick. And the centurion says, don't even come close. You don't even have to come to my house. You just say the word and he will be well. Which means Jesus has the power, the authority, and the ability to heal someone without even going there. But when Jesus was, got news that Lazarus was sick, the Bible records that he stayed for a few days before going to Lazarus. If any of us here have, have, have had loved ones, right, who is in critical condition, the first thing we will do is drop whatever we have and fly back to be at their side. If, for example, I'm overseas, right, and like my mom is critically injured and the doctor says uh, you only have, you only have uh, 24 hours until she passes away. And I pray and I hear the father say, don't go yet. Oh! <laughs> oh! I don't know how to be, how to live in that tension and yet still be fully convicted that he loves me and his, like, he loves me and he wants the best for me and he wants the best for everyone. I don't know how to live in that, in that, uh, that tension, you know. But yet Jesus was at that moment still fully convinced and convicted that the Father loves him, that he's willing to be misrepresented, misjudged by everyone, not letting them feel, not letting their opinions or anything cause him to shake this unshakable fact that the Father loves him. Recently, I have, uh, I have new responsibilities uh, added to my life. Uh, new responsibilities means new uh, like financial stuff, right? To provide and all of those things. And there are one or two nights where I feel, <gasps> can or not, can or not, can or not. I know can, la. the Bible says can. La. I believe can also. La. <laughs> you know, I believe he will provide one. I know it. But it just doesn't, sometimes, right, that fear inside just doesn't go away. It comes up every once in a while. And I, oh, I think in those moments, uh, God, do you, you really can or not? <laughs> can or not? <laughs> you know? And Jesus went through his entire ministry never fearing about it. In fact, he has so much trust in God to provide for his ministry financially that he chose someone who wanted to steal money from him, <laughs> from his ministry, right? He had such perfect trust in him. And I wonder, how would my life look like if I have perfect trust in him to share in that perfect unity, that perfect love that the Father has for Jesus? This is Jesus' desire in John 17, 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. He goes on to say this. In verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have, de de and I have declared to them your name and will, and will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. I repeat verse 26 again, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. 
Is the love of the Father shown towards Jesus in us? <laughs> the answer is yes, by the way. <laughs> the answer is yes, right? When Jesus prays earlier on, He says, God, I desire that they will be with me and I will be with them. He says this, that I will send the Holy Spirit to us. I will send the Holy Spirit to you and, and I am going away and it's good that I'm going away because I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And you know, this is what the Holy Spirit does with us. In Romans 5, 5, it says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For all believers, all Christians, all believers who believe in Him, who have the Holy Spirit residing in us, the Word says that the Holy Spirit reveals God's love that was shown towards Jesus to us as well. His love is shown towards us. It's revealed towards us that we can share and enjoy and receive the same love that Jesus has when He was on earth. And I, I ask myself, okay, but why doesn't my life look like Jesus? <laughs> right? How come my life don't look like Jesus? How am I not so convinced and convicted and secure as Jesus is? And the only reason that I can think of is because we are all, I am simply a work in progress. That I am made up of spirit, soul, and body. And my spirit is reconciled, redeemed, restored into this perfect relationship that that Jesus has intended for us, that it is one with us, one with Jesus, one with the Father, that my spirit has the ability to receive the love of God through the Holy Spirit. But my soul is still a work in progress, that there are things hindering me, there are things um, stopping me, uh, preventing me from, from actually receiving His love, right? ungodly beliefs, um, soul ties, all of those things that are preventing me from it. And the only way that I can think of um, getting rid of all of those things is well, through going back to Him again. Of course, we go through inner healing, we go through counselling, we go through therapy, we talk about it, we talk with our friends, we pray for each other. But the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals these things to us and He speaks life. He speaks life into every situation, every trial, every temptation that we have. And when He speaks to us, a portion of His love is revealed to us again. And we come into fellowship with the Father's love again. See, Jesus was tempted in all ways, in all ways, but yet He never sinned. So He knows what it's like to face trials and temptation, but never sinned to always come before the Father to receive strength from Him, to receive His identity from Him, to receive His, His portion from Him. So how do we receive this love? Right? How do we receive this love? And John 15 tells us the answer. All right? John 15 in verse 4 says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Let's continue reading. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. This verse is very popular for discipleship because it's always uh, referring to fruit and pastors and preachers and teachers will say, you want to bear fruit in your life? You got to abide in Him. You want to bear fruit? Then you got to do this. You know, the focus of this isn't really on fruit. The fruit is the byproduct. The focus in John 15 talks about abiding. In John chapter 13 to John chapter 17 is the whole Jesus washed the feet all the way until he prays uh, and then he, he's going to get arrested. From John 13 to John 17, Jesus is, is, is sharing with his disciples, 
I am with you, I'm one with the Father, I'm with you, abide in me, be with me, I'm one, I'm praying that you may be one in me as I'm one in you. He's giving over the course of 14, cha- 14 sorry, four chapters. He's trying to tell them over and over and over and over again, be connected with me. Right? Be connected with me. And in John 15 in the middle, he says, abide in me. Abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branch. He says this, right? I am the vine, you are the branch. Our focus shouldn't be... Uh, when um, I was asking the, the youth uh, last week, I said, how do we grow in patience? Right? And oftentimes people would say, I grow in patience. Uh, well, how, does, how, does, how do I grow in patience? Well, God will send people to test my patience. <laughs> We have all heard that before, right? Maybe some of us have even taught that as well, right? I can only grow in patience when God sends people to test my patience. Has that, has that worked for anyone before? I, I don't know, but, but it doesn't seem like what he's saying, right? How does the fruit of the Spirit um, mature in us? What bears fruit? Is it by putting ourselves in more, like surrounding ourselves with more impatient people? No. It's in John 15, verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Remember, we are the branch, right? Uh, We are the branch. Which means if we want to bear fruit, our sole job, our only responsibility is to abide in Him. And when trials and tribulations come, then we see the fruit of us abiding in Him over time, right? But Jesus here, His call to us here is saying, come, stay with me, abide in me, remain in me. When you remain in me, you're connected, uh, you connected to the vine. When you're connected to the vine, you're connected to the source and, and the love of God will flow through the vine, through the branches and through you. Remain in me, abide in me. Even then when I was preparing this, I started to think, okay, what can I do to abide in Him? And then He reminds me again, actually, you cannot do anything. Like, you think you can do something. But then He reminds me, actually, you know, Tiha, I've already done it for you. How did He do it for us? Right? He's done it for us through the Holy Spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit in us to remain in us, to dwell with us, to dwell in us, so that actually while, when He's saying abide in Him, actually He's already saying, actually I'm already abiding in you. <laughs> I am inside of you. The love of God is, is, willing to be, is willing to flow through you. You know, oftentimes we think, I think that I need to do something. But actually, the truth is, I should be letting him do his thing in me. And to the degree that we can let him do his thing, ironically, is a degree that we can actually do something. <laughs> right? So, imagine if all of us here come to that posture and that position of Holy Spirit, I am the branch, you are the vine. Help me abide in you today. I want to spend time to just remain in you. And as I remain in you, Holy Spirit, can you shed, reveal to me God's love. Show me God's love. Connect me to the source. Connect me to what He wants to say to me. Father, I'm here. Help me be connected with you. Imagine a group of people so secure in His love that they are willing to go above and beyond. That when the world sees us, they will see a people that is so different, so secure in His love that they will not let anything uh, shake them. 
that when they when we are recipients of his love our hearts are moved to love others when we are recipients of him who have walked two miles with us we are willing to walk four miles with others when we are recipients of him who have forgiven us a hundred thousand uh, bags of gold we are able to forgive others two hundred thousand you know, how does a group of people look like? Jesus actually explains to us through the parables. Oftentimes we read parables and, and we see that he's trying to tell us something. And, and I missed this point until yesterday, right? I missed this point, but I would like to share with us how he, actually when Jesus was on earth and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, Right? He's painting a picture of what this new kingdom will look like, what this new group of people will look like uh, when they are moved by His love, when they are convicted of His love. He's trying to, to, to show and, and illustrate this new kingdom that I am uh, creating, that I want to design, is radically different from the rest of the world. And it's the parable of the unforgiving servant in in Matthew 18, right? Uh, this is when Peter asked him, God, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? And Jesus says, 70 times seven. And he tells a parable of, uh, of a master who forgives um, a, a servant, right? Who owed him a huge debt, like 100,000 talents, something like that, right? And, and the master was very angry at him. He says, you owe me so much. If you cannot pay me, you sell, your, you sell your wife, you sell your children to pay me the amount. And the servant comes and the servant begs and says, I'm so sorry, please have compassion on me, please have pity on me. And the master seeing the servant was moved with compassion and forgave him all his debts. The parable then goes on to saying uh, how that servant didn't forgive another servant who owed him lesser money. right? And and we are often caught in that part. All right? We are often caught in how wicked this servant is who didn't choose to forgive someone who owed him less. But when Jesus was talking and describing the kingdom of heaven, right, describing this new kingdom, he's talking about a master who is willing to forgive a huge amount of debt. He's talking about a master who is willing to forgive an extraordinary amount. He's talking about a master who is actually really forgiving. One who is not afraid to cancel away the amount that, that the servant owe. Because he knows he doesn't need it. He's wealthy enough that he doesn't need the debt. Right? We are talking about a, a king who is so willing to forgive. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And when we come into this kingdom of heaven, we meet a king who is like this, willing to forgive huge, extraordinary amounts of debt so that we can be moved and we can enjoy, you know, enjoy his, um, his extravagance. So, if I can just invite the band up today uh, to just get ready, please. I would like to move us into a time of abiding in His love, where we just have space to come before Him, where we have space to uh, just be in that posture of being a branch, right? Of allowing the Holy Spirit to, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to lead us into whatever he wants to say. And if you are like me who struggle a bit, right, to understand, I'm still on this journey of like, God, how does this perfect love look like? How, how do I experience that? I want to encourage us with just one last parable. It's the parable of the yeast. It's only one verse, right? And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like yeast, who if you put it in a bag of, uh, in a bag of flour, will expand and be enough to feed 
100 people. This concept of um, abiding in his agape love, right? It might take some time for us to understand, to know, to grow, to learn. Um, but just like yeast, just a little bit, it starts off with just a little bit, it will slowly move and grow within our hearts. It will slowly um, move and multiply so that it affects the whole batch. This revelation that maybe some of us might be like, mm, I'm not sure what it means, I'm still trying to churn, I'm still trying to figure it out. What is agapetos? What is agape? I know I have a revelation of it, but just a small part. But I know with that small part, it will slowly grow and it will... In fact, it's not the right word. <laughs> That's the best word I have. It will infect my entire being. That one day, I believe, one day I can walk in greater revelation of how it is like to be the beloved of God. That all my problems, all my... Uh, trials, all my temptations will be met by the love of Him and He gives me all the answer. So John 15 verse 4 says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. For the rest of the service, I just want to invite us to abide in him. And uh, I feel led to just lead us in worship for a bit. Uh, to just create a space to lead us in worship, uh, to just encounter Him. Uh, so maybe for a start, we can all just stand. But as worship carries on, um, just feel free to take whatever posture is most comfortable for you, be it sitting down or standing, whatever it is, um, to just have your own space and time uh, to encounter Him. And remember, the key thing for now is just to have time for us to abide in Him, to come to Him, to have time to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal God's love into our hearts today. To agree in prayer, to agree with what Jesus says in John 17. To agree with His desire when He says, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me. Wouldn't you want to agree with his prayer that you are also with him? <laughs> to be able to receive the agape love that the Trinity first experienced, to be a part of that love relationship, that dance of love that they are experiencing to come into a place where we can experience that with Him. How great, how great, how great is the love that all of them, the Trinity is experiencing. And Jesus here says, I want you there with me. And He sends the Holy Spirit so that the, the love the Trinity has shared is in us today.